evening everyone. I'm so sorry to keep you waiting, but it's basically your fault for being in Dwarka. <laughs> <laughs> so don't have to get here from anywhere. Um, so we're going to talk about Rohini's book. Uh, before we start, I want to ask you to just excuse me if you hear me sniffling and coughing because I have a bit of a flu. It's not swine flu, <laughs> but um, it might just, I might be doing things that one should not do sitting on stage, like blowing my nose loudly. So, um, Rohini's book, as you know, many of you, I think, have read it, um, is about really the aftermath of the end of the civil war in Sri Lanka, and tells the story of what happened during and after through the lives of um, basically two people, um, and, and brings out in, uh, I think, really beautiful way how um, when war ends or when the hostilities end, or when in theory people put their guns down, there is still a whole lot that goes on after that which requires both humanitarian and state intervention. And if that does not happen, um, how the people who have inadvertently been involved in the war for no reason other than being of the ethnicity or the identity that is actually lined up on one side or the other side, um, or who have actually chosen to become involved because they believe in the ideals of uh, the uh, which which have governed that battle, which form the basis of that battle, but who might then become disillusioned with it or find it really difficult to maintain that belief, but who then have no choice because the escape from that is really really difficult. In this case, both because of the LTTE and because of the Sri Lankan government, the characters that Rohini talks about um, find it very, very difficult to escape from the web in which they are caught. So I'm going to start uh, really by asking you what it was for you um, that sort of led you to doing this work. I know you're a political journalist. I know you've had a couple of fellowships, which, and you wrote a long narrative, a non-fiction piece for Caravan, on, uh, which became the substance of your book later. But for someone young and um, not necessarily caught in the difficulties and the sort of uh, um, the grief, if you like, you know, um, and the trauma of war. How did, what was it that led you to this? And books don't tell us enough about how authors came to the subjects they write about. So would you like to tell us a bit about that? Thank you also for being here. The, um, for me, reporting in India was kind of a series of um, explorations into things that I that were furthest away from my own life. And um, it was a way of understanding my privilege, uh, my lack of clarity about what's going around in the world, and the inability to imagine when I read the newspaper what really was happening. Even though I was consuming all of that and trying to understand, I was uh, I kept feeling like I didn't know enough until I went to the field. And each time uh, I had, a, as a journalist, uh, reporting on maybe the, say the Kandamar uh, riots, 26, so each time I went to the field, I felt like I got a whole other picture, or a deeper understanding, and surely more confusion, of course, uh, which in a way made me feel better because everything otherwise I would read would have a, a stunning uh, surety about its black and whiteness. Um, and every time I went to the field, I found some more things that would make me understand and also go further away from the fixed meaning. So it was uh, for Sri Lanka. Uh, for Sri Lanka, it was mostly the 
So in 2009, so I, I grew up in Bangalore and I didn't really hear about the war except uh, you know, when Rajiv Gandhi was assassinated. Uh, I, I knew something was going on in Sri Lanka, but this just this vague understanding. I knew much more about uh, conflicts inside India. But when in 2009, the, I was uh, studying, uh, doing a master's after working for six, five years in India. I went to do a master's in politics, where I was specializing in political theory. And there, I was reading all of these things in a narrative set in this war on terrorism context. And also at that time, Manmohan Singh in India said that this was a great model uh, in which, you know, although 40 to 70,000 people had died and three million people were displaced, it might be. This is the way uh, we could probably meet Nasser. Uh, so this was, and, and and also in that same context, reading about this many people dying and being displaced, and it seemed like a very uh, that kind of model didn't seem to be a great thing to be replicated. Uh, so that's the first time I went to Sri Lanka. Uh, earlier I'd been as a tourist, and even at that time actually I had, was not aware. But uh, people told me not to go to the north and the east, yeah. and I wasn't. Uh, also allowed uh, under my visa to go there, and that was very annoying for me immediately. I guess that's a sort of journalistic instinct. Uh, where I wonder why am I not being allowed to a certain place, and that was that continued in 2009, and I went there to report, and um, I kept reporting but not writing anything, and feeling even more and more uh, that I needed to find out what it meant that when a militant group is but then still things were going on, things were gone underground. There was more more violence in a more insidious way. Uh, and things were not resolved. Uh, but they were all act people were the government was acting as if it was. Uh, so that was what made me keep going back. It became a kind of secret project while I had a full time job and you know, just going and doing it. So and then I wrote that uh, piece for Caravan when I felt that okay, there is I'm not able to say enough, maybe there is more to say and then it also, I guess, it takes a while for a person who's never written a book to admit to oneself that, okay, maybe I can try to write a book. So there was also that thing that I had to figure out in myself, uh, which took that much time. And I thought, in five years, I didn't fix that in five years, but after a point, it was hard to meet these people over and over. And they were also asking me for, uh, why haven't you, what are you doing? They stopped asking me about what the product. Um, they were just talking to me after that, but soon enough they were, uh, some of those people, like the activists and some of the other journalists who were, in, uh, who were in Sri Lanka, wanted to see something because they were tired of people coming and going and nothing being, nothing being done. Um, so I kind of felt that responsibility as well, so I started. Right. That was the five-year timeline, it wasn't even the thing that I decided. But how did you actually then, um, when you did this, I mean, it's, it's happened over a period of time, as you're saying, what were the first connections that you made uh, with people there who you could talk to? Because was there not a lot of mistrust of the outsider coming in to the story? Yeah, sure. And the outsider, you know, it's not, not just an outsider. Yeah. No, surely there was. And um, it, I, have, I had one friend who went to college with me had a house in Colombo and he was living there. And in, it was actually sitting in his house and listening to people. He, in the, he was an activist and there were many activists that would come and go. And I would hear everything that they are discussing. Um, and that was actually kind of my first proper learning of things. And they saw me as a person who didn't know anything. And that continued for many years after, uh, which I think is a very useful so people are explaining everything to me. And that was very useful. So that way, I guess, being an outsider helped that they did not assume any knowledge, uh, which was the same as I interviewed them. But as those activists went on the field, um, as some other you know, just locals visiting their family, I would just go along and put myself in as many situations as possible. And there were times that um, I didn't know, I mean, there were some 10 people I would have visited in one day, all of, all of them. Uh, child soldiers, former child soldiers, or the next day, and then the next day, I would be just going with someone who's handing out, uh, someone from the UN or something who's handing out some uh, relief material. I would just go along with them. In that way, I found uh, the three of the people that I've met. I, I actually.
actually interviewed eight people in depth uh, because it just because of lack of access and also only some relationships where trust exists, trust because I was able to build trust. Um, I would keep going back to Delhi, um, and over time I started realizing that I'm getting a whole kind, a different kind of narrative by just visiting those people over and over. And they were also reevaluating everything. Uh, they were thinking aloud, and I was around when a lot of things were going on in their lives. So it itself became, I think, the lack of access structured somewhere. Because there were no, and they would put me on to some other people. And they wanted other stories to be told, uh, and they always situated themselves in a context, and they never let themselves uh, tell the story as a unique story. So to me, so it was, um, and then these people that I visited uh, over time, it was also perhaps because of um, there were no hotels in these places in the north. But, uh, only now. Uh, so in 2009, 10, there were no hotels. There were some that everyone told me not to stay in. Uh, and the one time I defied that uh, advice and I stayed, it, it didn't go well. Uh, I lost all my notes and someone had searched my room. So I took people, those people's advice after that. And I would only, uh, you know, you have to go beyond the stupid way, yes. And after that, also because I was, um, I didn't go in, the, in a team, I went alone. And I'm a woman, and I'm Indian. Everyone, although they, I'm going there and seeing all the kind of trouble they are in, uh, they wanted to be the nation. They, uh, they opened their doors up. They would say, we, our conversation went out, went on for too long. Uh, they would ask me to stay with them. And of course, there is the ethical dilemma of whether you want to, to, to take away a part of their limited resources. But there was no other way out. I had to stay in some of their houses. And that also led to certain kind which I think being a woman, two of these, two of these that I was a with, gave me that access because we could lie on the same bed and have a conversation, uh, with, you know, well into the night, without it being an interview. Uh, so that was useful. And with Sarva, uh, who was, who, with whom I interviewed in the UK, uh, he was in a different position of those years, uh, in that situation when I interviewed him. He was not in Sri Lanka, he didn't have to worry so we were walking on the streets and talking and he, because of that, because for three months he was just waiting for asylum. So he had nothing to do but to think about everything that happened and I was there. Uh, so some of it, I mean it seems like luck but I was putting myself in those situations where people are thinking aloud and that is what the kind of post-war and aftermath, I had never, I had never reported like that before. So also interesting to me and challenging and I didn't know where it was going but I think that's what helped me enter their lives in that way. Isn't it interesting though that um, he received wisdom about doing something like this generally that you have to talk to a reasonable but in quotes sample of people to get uh, anything approximating scale or depth or anything. But what you're saying is quite the contrary, the fact that you basically talk to two or three people and talk to them at length and over a period of time and go back and back to them. Um, actually gave you a better idea. No, actually I did talk to a lot uh, because I was doing the regular thing and for going to a place that I had no idea about. Um, apart from uh, what apart from what uh, friends had told me. Going to that kind of place meant uh, always having a certain insecurity and a worry that I just did not know it. For example, when I would not get a joke in a group, I would worry that I'm going to say something wrong in the group at some, in some context. Uh, or, you know, at night, uh, after everyone's had dinner, people have, are sitting around and uh, that is, some of them are having some things and that is when they look at me and say, you know, that day when I told you, you said, uh, you know, that's not how it happens in India. I'll tell you how it happens. You know, they would be angry. So I would always know that there were some things that culturally, because I have not grown up with things, I didn't know. So I was talking across the board to beat that. I didn't know whether I was going to write about that or not. Um, and I, w I was reading uh, academic books and reading other a lot of fiction uh, 
uh, there's a lot of fiction writers from Sri Lanka who I guess they can't write only fiction because they are Sri Lankan uh, and they would get trouble if they could. And also they are dealing with it in different ways. And there was a lot of poetry, there were a lot of conversations that I would just sit in. Um, I, would, I interviewed people in government, soldiers, other civilians, um, you know, economists, people in LTD, politicians, I interviewed across the board for the for the, the one sentence in which I can say that Sri Lanka has seen de different kinds of violence since its independence. I, I, would, I felt that I would have the authority to say that only then, uh, which is sometimes now when I'm back in journalism uh, on a regular basis, uh, I have to kind of invert that and say that it's all right to uh, be sure about some things if you've read enough and all of that. But, uh, that gave me the uh, almost the matrix in which to situate these people and their stories. So when they would say that, they, when they, someone would ask me, oh, you live in a Sinhalese friend's house. Uh, what is their food like? Do they use tamarind? Mm -hmm. and, and then we would begin a conversation in which I would realize that a person who lived in a certain part of the north would probably, and who was around 30 years old, would had the high chances were that they had never met a Sinhalese person in their life. So, and did not even know what they ate. And while there were only three major groups of the communities in the, in the country. So, um, so I think it was, uh, it was because I didn't know where what, that it was uh, one article or one project. Um, and I was just trying to understand it, also very aware of things happening in India. And in that context, trying to understand not just Sri Lanka, but also the situation of uh, ethnic discrimination and polarization. So I, I was trying to understand more than just Sri Lanka, which made me put myself in a lot of uh, conversations and talk to more people than I need to have, I guess. You know, one of the things that comes through very strongly uh, in your book is, uh, of course, the question of ethnic identity and how that is structured and how that polarizes But also the whole business of uh, the notion of home and uh, what is home made up of. Uh, and I don't know if I'm wrong in thinking this, but from the way you talk about it, especially with Mobile, is that how you say it? Um, it's not so much the physicality of a place as it is all the things that surround it, and food is one of them. You know, when you mentioned Cameron, I remember how many times Cameron comes up in the book as something that is so essentially a part of the cuisine and that uh, is lost. You know, whether they will get food which has camera in it or not in it and that sort of thing. So did you find this uh, in, in your explorations of the whole question of home? What did you come up with? What is what for people means home or home and home? Because it seems for the for the refugees at the end, the only constant was movement, not so much the fixity of the place. Some of the first people that I met in uh, Sri Lanka were in, in, in the town community, were in the refugee camps, in the IDP camps. So, and most of them had been uh, in the in that you know the year moved, had uh, involuntarily been displaced, forced to be displaced from village to village. Uh, but when they and I thought that that was really, and they were talking about everything that they left behind. From, from the first house they left, they would take a, bag, a couple of bags or maybe a motorbike. And how the further they went away from there, they had to choose what was more priceless. The things were shared and all along. And, and five, in 2011, I was able to go to the part where the, the final uh, stages of water break, the only by color room. And over there, still, I, I wasn't, you're not supposed to go in, but I went with some uh, priests, some Christian priests, who were going there to retrieve something. And there were piles of cycles, piles of tractors, piles of you know school bags, and they were divided in that way. And it felt like uh, uprooted cities just being thrown into mount little mountains of things, uh, fruited towns. And when I interviewed people, uh, they were thinking about these things, but also about not, not at all about how they would recreate it. 
when they when they moved to another house, for example, um, they told. I mean, I, at Mughal, I had conversations with her about home in the house that she in the abandoned house that she moved into because she had nowhere else to go. And that was not that's not a dumb thing. Most people don't move into abandoned houses, and it was something I noticed because in India, if in crowded places, any abandoned space would be taken over by someone who's homeless. But that is not how it happens there yet, in Sri Lanka at all. Uh, and also because of a certain dowry system in uh, most of the high caste in Sri Lanka, in the Tamil community, uh, most families, however poor, they have a house. Uh, very few people are homeless. So most of the homelessness uh, came from the actual uh, the conflict. And it was so common that somebody had moved 19 times in their life. It was so, so normally said. They would count all the villages and then they would say, okay, I guess 19, 9. Uh, and none of that was really, almost almost always it was not voluntary. And in, in all of these places, then the constant would be things that they're keeping, uh, they're, they're trying to hold together, like schooling. Even in the refugee camps, there were kids uh, that weren't writing exams. That the first One of the first things after toilets and everything they asked for were schools, shared schools inside the energy camp. Uh, so they had almost been used to uh, not having a house. And it was interesting that in all this homeland conversation um, in the Elam um, and you know what was so rooted in the territory, uh, they could both value that community as somewhere where as long as we are all together, there will be some place where we can call you know, safe home. Uh, at the same time, uh, think of this boundary, uh, this elam with a boundary. It, and uh, for, especially for women, some a lot of things came about, came up uh, among women about house because it is what they managed, it is what they set up, and often because of the dowry system uh, uh, among the Velala caste, uh, it was in their name. So it was their house. And in that house, to uh, to leave it behind, they, they would have this memory and they would they would say what all happened there. And then there would be this house. And then they, everyone would go back to it, uh, hope to go back to it. But after some time, you just forget about it. There's no, there's no going back to it. So I, I mean, there were so many different ways in which people saw that, uh, saw home. But most of all, most interestingly for me, I found that um, for women, that was kind of the safest space, as it is in every, I guess, in every kind of South Asian community. So, and it was in their control. And it was almost as if the displacement was their responsibility to set up another house. Every house that I went to had very little furniture. They would not even bother by it. Uh, many houses in the Bani did not have doors and windows because um, they would take it out for wood, or some people would also steal it. So they were just shells in shape. But all the time, it was just where you can take the most priceless things, where you can take the most important thing, and inside you, the hope that at some point you will have the homeland. Uh, not everyone, whoever whoever wanted that. Uh, it was it was it was the dream, and the further you went away from having physical spaces of home, the surer you were about having that homeland, which would be yours, and where you would not have to move out. Of. One of the things that comes through really powerfully in your book is what you're talking about, um, which is how, uh, in the midst of all this terrible violence and conflict, it's women who somehow um, keep things together. I mean, Sarva's mother and the endless, endless ways in which she is trying to help her son out. I mean, often at the cost of relationships with other people in the family in herself and all the women she works with and the little business they set up for providing food and so on and so forth. This is something that you don't actually see very much in uh, political writing. And there's not been much about it in Sri Lanka also, Sri Lanka writing, or has there? It's about the yeah. Uh, I think that the, uh, I was telling you earlier, Sharika uh, in my mother's house, uh, tries to capture that uh, because even all the minorities have defined their lives with displacement, and especially. And so she spoke. She spoke to so many women. It was really 
interesting for me to read that because it had so many, it was almost exactly the same conversations I had with, with people, uh, with women. And also, right now, uh, I don't know the exact number. Now, the last time I found out, uh, 2012, uh, there were 59,000 women-headed households. Uh, and mo mo in most of the places, even the men, when they were there, they, if they were in any way part of the movement, uh, of the entity, or they lived anywhere there, uh, they were they would not find employment very easily, or at all. Um, so the women had the responsibility to start, uh, because they were, Although they were part of entity uh, and they were also recruited and there was a pretty large uh, women's wing, they somehow, because of the stereotypes and because of the Sinhalese uh, uh, or the Sri Lankan government uh, leeway, that they just gave them a little bit, little bit more leeway. Uh, so, like Mobil was able to continue to live with her family because some one person took pity on her or didn't notice her. Something as uh, slight as that can change so much in your life for years together. And so for her to set, set up uh, a house again and everything was her responsibility and it was for her especially, for someone who had attached herself to the entity and not the family uh, in her childhood, to do this switch to now I will take care of the family was really interesting and interesting of course and it really uh, it was interesting to see her kind of deal with just small things normal things which I the other women would do so easily um, and I found that uh, what I think some a little bit has been written uh, about the women uh, quite a lot actually has been written about the women's wing but it was all during the entity's existence so what information a lot of the information that came out uh, was seeped in propaganda, and which is the kind of femi uh, pro very propagandist uh, feminism that they used to recruit women as well. And so those who were in the in, in the entity and those who were civilians, there was a there was clearly they, they would mark that difference. Uh, you had freedom, but you did not. You had family, and there was that marked difference. And when those things, those divisions collapsed after the end of the war and the non-existence of the entity, uh, it, I was really interested to see how the community is dealing with that. Um, and many of them faced a lot of uh, uh, discrimination within their family, within their families and within their community and certain kind of expectations that suddenly are dumped on them, you know, because or overnight you are expected to be feminine again, you, you are expected to know how to cook, you are expected to take care of the children and want children and all of that, and not talk politics, not read the paper. So it was, it was an interesting thing to see, but at the same time those women that, um, uh, you know, those, those the, the kind of femininity that was protected in this area, uh, in, you know, under the, under the entity and other military groups, they were supposed to hold within them the Tamil identity of the wearing the bindi and a certain uh, how neatly you wear the sari. You have to inhabit the identity because the identity is under attack. So you are responsible for that as well. That doesn't change. Yeah, that doesn't change. And in fact, it becomes stronger because now that you are defeated, then you have, uh, you're dealing with a kind of politics from the government that is trying to assimilate you, uh, teach you, uh, Singhalese, your children are going to schools where there is they're learning Singhalese. So you have all the responsibility to keep the identity alive. Uh, so it, in, I felt like they were fighting kind of two wars. While the men they were they were under they were intimidated and attacked by the Sri Lankan government. The women had this thing they had to do this thing they were struggling with even within their community. Um, so which is which is why I kept these conversations didn't really come up like this. They would just someone would just say it in an irritated way. Uh, that, for God's sake, how many times, how many do I have to make putte every night? You know, just something so irritating for them because they didn't want to do that. Uh, I, I started, then I would ask them some more. And I also left my <coughs> dictaphone in Google's house and Indra's uh, house. I just left it with them because there was not, I couldn't be there all the time. And also I, would, I was coming back to India and going back for three months a year. Um, and then they would just say things in it. Uh, and a lot of times it would be them abusing their someone in their family. 
or, or just their frustrations in which they're shouting at their child or something which is got recorded uh, or some songs they remember. So it was interesting. I, I didn't have the opportunity to do that with Sarka uh, because I was there for the time. Um, but it was it was interesting to see that kind of uh, the way the women were thinking about where they were and what was happening to them. So uh, it was so obvious that I, I was wondering why this is not part of everything that I have read before uh, in that kind of obvious way. But it may be the product of the moment in that in those five years uh, that people were feeling the need to speak about that, and because it was taking shape, also people were figuring themselves out. Yeah, so. It could also be the product of long-term relationship and trust, yeah. because then you can speak over a period of time. And how much time do we have? Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes? Okay. Okay, so I am going to ask you a completely different question now, um, which is, uh, let me preface it by saying that uh, I love your book. And I am... Um, then it's going to be a bad question. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a... Uh, could be a bad question. The question is, um, you know, you used the techniques of fiction to write a uh, non-fiction book. You put yourself into the heads of people. And you imagined what they would have thought, what they would have said, and you actually sort of used dialogue. Um, so my question is twofold. One is, how you, no matter how close you became to them, how could you have known that in three points? Why did you choose to do that? And third, the reason I'm asking you this is I um, read this book which you may have read or probably know of, uh, Catherine Wu's Beyond Beautiful Forever, which is a book about a slum in Bombay. And it's a stunning book. And she does the same thing. It's like the it's like you're reading a novel. It's the authorial voice which is actually uh, telling you the stories and uh, I found her book very disturbing. I didn't find that with yours, maybe because you're Indian and she's, you know, we are all part of this white person doing this thing and so on and so forth, I don't know. Um, but I found it very disturbing because the question for me was, A, how can you know? And B, can you put your, I mean, you can only put yourself into the head of somebody who's a survivor, victim, poor, I mean, would Catherine Wu have dared to put herself into the head of Anil Ambani? Probably not. So why did you choose to use this technique? Because your material is so powerful. And a straightforward narrative nonfiction would also have done it. And I'm going to be teaching a workshop in narrative nonfiction writing. I'm going to use a chapter of yours to raise a discussion about this. But I'm just curious. So is it such a bad question? No. <laughs> it's a tough question. Uh, but it's a question that I have asked myself several times. So, uh, and each time I come up with different reasons I did it. Um, one thing was what, uh, why I did it was as I was gathering on the material and um, feeling like uh, every narrative was almost pushing against the more historical narrative or trying to fit into that. Um, so I decided that I have to write about a few people. So that was the first time I thought. Then the other is that I, I guess more mundane reason is that I read more fiction than non-fiction. And I love fiction and it affects me more deeply than most non-fiction has. Um, and, I, and I thought about that. I was reading uh, Adichie's book, uh, Half Fear of Sun. It's fiction and it's, it's about, and it went so long ago, about Bhatra, and. Uh, it was because I was able to enter that uh, that conflict, that war, with through a uh, few families that I felt that I cared about something that I did not know about that was so far away from me. So that was, I mean, I, it made me start thinking about writing in that way. And so I wondered whether I should just write fiction uh, with just the research and the material. But that is just not something I could allow myself when I was meeting these people every day, that um, I was going to take this material and make it fiction. And also I felt a sense of responsibility in the context of 
or very little documentation or what emerging documentation about it from the UN uh, people who were in the UN before. There was this film, Callum McRae's uh, documentary, Killing Fields. Uh, there were all things coming out in which evidence and documentation was important. So I was also feeling the need to do that. Um, in the end, what I had as a journalist, what I felt I could do was to inform a lay leader about something that happened in a way that gave them uh, the face of one of the four, one of the three million people, so that they would care about the, the other people apart from these people. Um, and for that, the way to enter it maybe was only through the, just their stories. I was kind of also tired of a very mass, especially because of the method I was employing in which I was undercover. I was doing a lot of things uh, that if I wrote about would seem like it was more about me. Uh, if I had to write about my method, in general, as a journalist, you don't write about your method at all. Suddenly in the book, to write about that, I was very uncomfortable. And also, that was just how all nonfiction books, that most nonfiction books that I had read about uh, conflict situations were written, especially if they were journals, uh, in which they are learning about something and they are just, uh, you know, in that, what everything they are doing, the conversations they've had, and then what they thought. So then I also have to be a character. I really was not ready for that. That's a, that's a personal reason. I was not re re ready to put myself in there and write about it. But I have this responsibility of telling their stories. Uh, so I stuck with nonfiction, but need to capture a narrative and to capture interest, uh, to evoke empathy, something, uh, an attachment to a place that no, they may not know about, made me write it, write about three people. And in the way, I actually didn't think that I had um, voice, but I guess I, I did after a point. I was giving, I was trying to write it in their voice, but it can't just be testimonies, especially when a lot of the things that they're saying sometimes were unverifiable. But what they thought in most of the situations, uh, I mean, maybe you can tell me the one, the, the chapter that, maybe you can give me one example, but m almost everything that I, that they wondered what they were, where, they where they're telling you when I've written what they're thinking, or most of it is stuff that they do themselves, and often it was stuff that I would ask them, what did you think of at the time? What was going through your mind? Or weren't you angry? Or something, and which to which they would respond. Um, because I felt that that was as real as some of the dates and the facts that they had to give. And it always feels to me that not only does it affect me as a reader more, uh, and make me remember that scene much better, but also that is as real. People may think that it's a soft reality, but I think it is real and important to to also document because all the forms of the activists and all the all the legal cases don't have that. So we'll, it'll be in their memory and it'll change. And in over five years itself, it changed so much that you know, 20 years down the line, that would just not be there, or their children will know it, and it will become this kind of ghost of a story. You know that when my grandmother crossed three villages and. You know, it just becomes that story. The dialogue was something that um, I had to take a call on, and I, am, I, I admit I'm not still sure whether it was the right decision or not. But for me, it was how people were telling the stories. And then I said, and then he said, and then he said. That's how they were saying most of the stories. Uh, I was talking to them in Tamil, uh, so there was a lot of side tangents, everything that they would add to it. And then there was this guy, and he looked at me like he didn't believe me. And then I told him. So that's how people say their stories. Uh, and I thought, why should I remove that and make it, you know, they had a conversation and he didn't believe her. It was, it was also a way to keep their voice for me, that, the dialogue. But for me, it would be interesting when if I am trying to get it translated in Tamil uh, and trying to find a Sri Lankan Tamil to do it, that would be interesting <laughs> because I have written their notes as they were saying, I have written it in English. To go back to what they said, actually, I have some record. Most of some of it is recorded. Some of it is just notes and what I've write notes at in my room at, at night. Uh, so that would be interesting to see. So I guess Catherine Wu was somebody who just gave me the when I I did read the book, but after uh, because I heard so much about it and the same kinds of things that I was thinking about was what she was articulating. And I also found it really odd that for a person who did not put herself in the book, most of the reviews and the interviews were about why she did not do it and like and that explanation. And she was she was the point of the book sometimes. Uh, that also maybe because of the Westerner writing about India, I guess. Um, but it legit, uh, I read her author's 
note or something. She has a game that I read while I was writing, and it to me validated my decision to not put myself in the book. Most of and also, I saw I did wonder whether women tend to make that decision more easily uh, as a woman writer uh, because most of the fiction, non-fiction that I had read on Sri Lanka mostly were male and they were all in the book. Uh, and I wondered about it and I thought should I stand and just put myself in there but it was just I was not ready to be as interesting a character in the book as everybody else uh, and just that was not uh, it would be too swashbuckling and too macho and that was not how I wanted to present the story at all it's too distracting and there's so much else I have to already say that it was not possible that to do all of this together and do be honest with the material. I think it's really interesting how uh, writers take different approaches. I was thinking as you were talking that in uh, my work on partition, I did exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. So it's not true that men put themselves in mm -hmm. I mean, okay. I did. I was very much in that book. And uh, the decision to do so actually uh, happened because initially, because it's so based on interviews. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was using those interviews, but I kept feeling that in some ways those interviews had transformed the way I thought about at that moment. And it would be dishonest to uh, keep myself out of it because I was deeply affected by it. And so I did put myself in there to the extent of uh, talking about my own dilemmas, of the ethicality of the research, of the exploitation of people you interview. Uh, the, their expectations from you and what you might be returning, if at all, to them, and all of those things. Uh, and it then turned into an extended reflection on the writing of history through interviews. And many of the things you've said um, resonate really deeply. For example, you, you talked about you know, the question of facts and what people say at a particular moment, uh, and the verifiability of the to me, it's really important that what people say and their memory of a particular moment is for them the history of that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, so in a sense, the factual history of that moment, within quotes the factual history, uh, is not necessarily offering you anything better of a deep or depth than what they are saying. In fact, what they are doing is expanding and stretching the boundaries of that history and putting into it the things that are absent in history, which is really emotion, which is really feeling. Grief and sorrow and devastation and all of those things, which are very much part of it. So it's just interesting to me that um, writers take very, very different approaches. I see what you're saying is completely legitimate. I haven't yet decided which chapter I'm going to use. <laughs> I will tell you, but it's just a question that. Uh, no, I, I agree, and, and it's actually, I, you know, if I had done, uh, put myself in there, uh, anyway, that was actually the most. Think, the thing that I was most sure of, that I would not be in the book. Uh, that was just some, I don't know that I, maybe some years down the line, I, I, think I, I will figure out why I did it. But to say their stories in the, in the way that, that you said maybe sounds like fiction, was at every point someone feels, oh my god, this happened, and I feel this, they should remember that this is real. I, I wanted that. And even if they forgot for some time, it's okay. But they will know that this is not fiction. And so I, I told my publishers to promote it properly, as loudly as possible, the non-fiction part, uh, although they wanted it to be kind of vague, because people then would feel more confident picking up a book and maybe they would enjoy it, which they might not feel for non-fiction. But I thought that if, um, maybe it's a personality thing about not putting yourself there. At this point, I really don't feel, and also if, okay, honestly, one of the main things is that, so I am a half Tamil, I'm a Tamil speaker, and I did not grow up in Tamil Nadu. So I'm an outsider Tamilian even in, in India, uh, and had not known anything about it. And I felt that it was, if I had to confront, because as they confronted me in Sri Lanka, about my identity, and assumptions that because I spoke Tamil, I'm there because I, I'm on their side, if a lot of entity people thought that, a form of entity, that, and also expecting me to feel that uh, nationalistic feeling, um, that was that whole other ball, the whole other section that I had to deal with. And uh, at the time, 
feeling that I should write this story, these, this what happened there, and all these people's stories and what happened in Sri Lanka. It was not at that time. I was not ready to also deal in the book, in the same book. It, how many things would it do in the same book with my identity and how different it was, or how similar it was, of also an Indian, uh, which is another complicated relationship with Sri Lanka. Um, and it was, you know, at some points they would hold me responsible as an Indian, and at the point they would call me uh, a traitor as a as a Tamilian. Uh, so it was all of these things that were so mixed up in it that uh, I was as outsider as they thought I was an insider. But at every point, by the end of it actually, there were times that I just wanted to move to Sri Lanka, I was in love with it and I was love, in love with these people and you have to have that moment I guess, maybe that's when I decided to write it as a book. But soon enough I started realizing, you know, at moments where they would say, oh what is there for you, you will go back to your house. So in those moments I started realizing what, how much of an outsider I am. And I didn't want to deal with my conflict in the middle of all of this. In the, actually, or maybe I was not ready for it. At some point, maybe I will be. Um, because I didn't feel any of those nationalistic feelings or, or ident my identity was totally different from theirs. Uh, but because of the structures, it gave me an information, it, it informed my understanding of how an identity can be even imposed on you, um, as it was on me. And in, that, in those interactions, I guess that, that was the interesting part that made, I, I, every time I thought that that was something interesting, I would tell myself that at some point maybe I'll write an article on it or something, you know. Um, I was not ready to put all of that in the book, uh, in competition with the space for these people's stories as well. So I guess it's a, some inability of some sort as well, and nervousness. Okay, I have a last question for you to open it up, uh, and that is, um, how did you, you know, when you read the book, you see these terrible stories of cruelty, violence, uh, um, sort of um, inhumanity of human beings towards others, how cruel we can be, um, how much violence we can perpetrate, the torturers, others, but you also see the in, uh, very profound resilience of human beings and how they go out of that, uh, what they hold on to the them hope. When you were doing the research, did this grief, violence, all that ever become a pressure on you? Did you ever feel, why am I doing this? Why am I caught in this? And when you finished, I handed you the book on the what did you do? So I think because at some point uh, the people I was interviewing sort of gave up on the fact that I would be writing something, um, they didn't even ask me if I had finished. Of the time, and also because after a point they just didn't, they forgot that I was there to interview them. Uh, then. And then, you know, I was attending their weddings and I was, they called me still every week as I used to call them. So the process of the reporting seems to be still going on. And they, they uh, because now they don't, they wanted the story out, I must have. And because of that connect, lack of connection, well, the part I didn't answer about the access, entering the mind of a, a, a non-poor person, I guess that, I, I would say I'll answer that. But here, uh, so I am still in touch with those people, and in fact, they will uh, hold me responsible for when I don't call them. Um, so it didn't end actually uh, the process at all. Uh, but the the writing, I, I felt like I felt actually very dissatisfied and did not feel uh, that I had done full justice. But I also told myself that this is what I could do at the time, and I had to just give it up. Um, in terms of how it affected me, there were there was. Uh, the, at all times, I was conscious that there was a there was a home that I had to go back to, uh, and I was not living in Sri Lanka. So there was that that affected me most. And in terms of what had happened in their past, when people would tell me what everything that had happened to them, um, it was not that particular story, but the barrage of stories and on a, on a certain day talking to. Because any time I had access, I would talk to as many people as possible, or attend a counseling session, counseling session or something, and one by one they would all come and talk about how they lost someone. Um, so it was 
so after a point, there were, I mean, I, I remember distinctly a point at which I felt so numb that I was not listening to the person talking to me. And um, as I realized it, I felt so guilty and so, um, I mean, that was just the worst thing to do to someone who was just saying the story, uh, saying what happened to them. Um, and at that point, I called my mother and I said, this is, she had no idea what I was doing there, but I, this is something I called up and uh, I just told her. Um, and that's when I did, and someone I had also met a few days earlier, uh, who worked with the ICRC, who pulled out bodies and done all of that. He told me about R&R &R and it's about that moment where you go back and realize all the things that are important and the things that you, one thing is you're realizing what you have. It's a, I don't know, I feel like, I would feel very selfish when I think that but also realizing that there is a normalcy that even they want, which you have. And that is what keeps you steady and sane. And in that context, when I was listening to them, I felt that I could uh, deal with it. And I could also give that more importance than my exhaustion or my difficulty with listening to it. Because all they are seeking is also the kind of comfort in life that I have. So it was, it, that made it a little easier to deal with. Um, but otherwise, you know, there were so many ways in which they were not always talking about, I mean, as, as I'm sure you also know, that they don't always talk about this at all. They're tired of talking about it sometimes, and they are just uh, bitching about their neighbor or, uh, you know, just asking me about my family or, you know, asking if we are going for a movie. Uh, that kind of thing, not we are going to be watching a movie in their house. Um, and I would uh, be asked to bring, you know, DVDs from India and all that. So, they just... At, at times when they would ring there and they, of course Sarva, all he wanted to talk about was his girlfriend and it was just really hard to even get him to talk, which just also taught me something um, about what he really thought about um, and what he did not want to think about. Uh, and you know, when, and then there was that ethical question of should I ask him to talk about what he does not want to think about. But there was a reason in the way in which he was using me because he had his asylum interview and he wanted to bounce off certain things and tell me the story. Uh, and so he was using me for that as a sounding board. Um, so I happened to be there for all that and there are uh, at all times they were not talking about violence and at these times when they would talk about uh, the good times and the, the future happy times that they were all working towards, that's when I realized that it's not just resilience but just a, a great compartmentalization that everyone we all do. Um, so I also compartmentalized to this kind of and my life from this. Okay. The Ambani part. The yeah. Ambani part. Yes. The Ambani part, I think that is a great limitation that I have. I can't, end, I have not learned to enter uh, someone, uh, the mind of, maybe someone of my class, maybe, yes I can, but I know I, I would, if I worked hard I could, but someone else, it's like a challenge, I want to do it, but I don't know how to yet. But it, because it is something that uh, I feel they will hold me more responsible, they will not be as trusting, which is how I found, uh, which is the experience I've had with interviews with politicians. Um, but there have been moments that they open up, which gives me the hope that maybe if you persevere there also, you'll be able to enter. Whether I'll give myself that right, uh, it's a good question to keep, challenge yourself with all the time, I guess.